Welcome back to Balanced Health. On today's show, we're discussing the importance of sleep with Dr. Andrew Mouchon. But before we continue our discussion, let's take a look at this week's Debunking the Myth. Joe? Has something to do with sleep, doesn't well, it? Well, subject appropriate. Our <laughs> myth is that caffeinated drinks help you overcome a lack of sleep and exhaustion. And of course, the debunk of that myth is that caffeine only masks the problem and helps lead to increased insomnia. I, I kind of liken it to, um, you know, getting a bigger can of bug spray to take out to the dumpster because there's too many bugs. You know, until you <laughs> remove that garbage and solve a problem, yeah. you know, you're going to just keep going through bug spray. Caffeine um, does help you cope, though, but it's well, for a while, right? Well, caffeine, and I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, to, uh, to uh, quote, uh, elaborate on this. I'll just throw the point out there, the discussion point out there, and that's that caffeine, some people react to caffeine very differently mm. than others. People that's who tend true. to have anxious personalities, uh, maybe have a tendency towards higher blood pressure, a lot of those kind of things in, in the background they react to caffeine very negatively. So why it might give them a temporary energy boost, there's some real long-term ramifications mm. to it. I have to think that that's one of the major things you guys look at with people when they come into your sleep centers. Caffeine can be a, a terrific problem, and I think a lot of people don't appreciate uh, the ef actual effect that it has on sleep. There's no doubt, caffeine is a stimulant, and it's a, it can be a powerful stimulant, and if you consume a lot of it, uh, the effects are profound. The problem is that it, it doesn't in any way replace sleep. Right. So if a person is sleep deprived and tired and sleepy and not functioning well, uh, while the caffeine may help you to actually stay awake, it, it doesn't replace the sleep. And uh, it's amazing, I see people who complain of difficulty falling asleep or waking up a lot during the night um, and we find out that they routinely drink uh, coffee or other caffeinated beverages uh, late in the afternoon, late into the evening. Oh, yeah. um, How about could... food and snacks? There's certain chocolate and some of these things have caffeine in it as well, right? Certainly, but, but chocolate doesn't tend to be the offender that caffeinated Yay! drinks does. Yay! Actually, have a little uh, chocolate snack at night. <laughs> just liberating, surely. That's probably not such a problem. But, but, but caffeine definitely keeps us up at night when we're trying to fall asleep. It can uh, fragment our sleep and cause problems uh, even if we are able to fall asleep. So it is, it is a significant well, drug. I have to tell you though, it does affect people differently. I mean, if I have one cup of coffee at night, it affects me, or even mm -hmm. after three in the afternoon. My sons, which who Joe knows, yeah. can drink a whole pot of coffee and then go to, go to bed and go right to sleep. Why yeah. is that? That makes me so angry. My husband can do the same thing. I don't think that has to do with uh, the person not being affected by the caffeine. My suspicion is somebody who's drinking coffee late into the evening may be significantly sleep deprived and is, is hmm. sleepy. And the reason they fall asleep is not because they're immune to the effects of the caffeine, it's, it's a commentary on the severity of their sleep deprivation. Really? Yes. Interesting. So, that makes a lot of sense. It does make sense. There are a lot of people who seem to think <laughs> that caffeine doesn't affect their sleep. Uh, that's probably not true. If so we it affects actually, everybody. If we actually brought those people into the laboratory, gave them caffeine, and studied their sleep, we would be able to see the effects of caffeine on sleep. Mm -hmm. Well, caffeine basically manipulates the autonomic nervous system, right? Which mm -hmm. is supposed, when you lay down and you start falling asleep and maybe you hear that first little snore or you have that little quirk or whatever. I mean, that's that autonomic nervous system slowing down, right? And when caffeine is hanging around in the system, it doesn't have to mess with that, your autonomic nervous system a whole lot to affect your sleep, correct? Absolutely. The, the, the basic uh, line on caffeine is that it is a stimulant. And any stimulant drug uh, is certainly going to have the potential to keep you awake. Uh, it does just the opposite of, of uh, what sleep does. So, mm. Well, for all those, I'm sorry. I was just, we're going to be ask you about the stages of sleep because we started to talk about, um, you know, what I was just describing there. Mm -hmm. We have these different stages of sleep. You hear about REM sleep, rapid eye movement, and people mm -hmm. think, you know, geez, that means my eyes are closed and they're bugging all over the place. What, what, what are these stages? What are they called and what do they mean? Well, there, there are two main states that we look at in sleep. One is called REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, that's the stage of sleep where most of your dreams that you remember are going to occur. Mm -hmm. um, and rapid eye movement sleep is characterized by <coughs> such things as rapid eye movements. You can see them under someone's eyelids when they're sleeping or 
Uh, wow. Maybe you've seen them in your dog when they're sleeping. <laughs> they have REM sleep too. Uh, the other is, is non-REM sleep or non-rapid eye movement sleep. And there are four stages of that, stage one, two, stages one, two, three, and four of non-REM sleep. And you can think about the non-REM stages as being along a depth continuum, where stage one is the lightest stage of sleep. So it's the easiest stage of non-REM sleep to wake someone up in. Okay. Stage four being the deepest stage of sleep and the most difficult of the non-REM stages to wake someone up in. Mm. Um, and, and what are the benefits? Does, does like the, the stage one not, not really benefit your body that well, much? Or stage one is again the lightest stage of sleep and, and some people describe it as sort of that twilight zone between wakefulness and sleep. Kinda You're not dozing. really awake, not really asleep. Okay. Uh, if you walk into a bedroom when someone is in stage one uh, and ask them if they're asleep or awake, about 50% of the people will say they're asleep and 50% will say they're awake. So <laughs> Which is funny either way. I'm asleep. <laughs> some might argue that it's not even really asleep. I'm holding a lot of water, sleep. I'm sorry. Um, That's funny. There's been a lot of work done to try to find out which of the stages is the most important or the most mm. critical. Okay. And unfortunately, I think a lot of this work was driven by uh, questions related to how we can shorten sleep but hmm. still maintain our functioning during the daytime. In other words, if we were to cut out one stage of sleep, what would be the best one? It turns out that while there are definitely physiological differences, all of the stages seem to be very important and critical to our functioning again during the daytime. So, How about the uh, old uh, early to bed, early rise thing? Is, do, we, do, we, do we find that based on the sunset and the sunrise, circadian rhythms, is there, is there any part of that or is it eight good hours is eight good hours any time? Well, the, the timing of sleep, and you mentioned circadian rhythms, can be very, very important. Um, if people try to go to sleep when they're not sleepy because they believe, for example, that they should go to bed early, uh, they may be at higher risk for developing insomnia. The truth is we should go to bed when we're sleepy. Mm -hmm. And the clock in our brain or the, the circadian timekeeping system that's built in will tell us when hmm. that time comes. Well, you know, some people, and I think Joe and I both fit into that category, you know, our minds race, our minds, we're, we're kind of hyper, our minds are racing, we're active people. I mean, because I know, like, for instance, my daughter, totally different personality. She can sleep anytime, anywhere. She has to have her nine hours, you know. It's good, personality kind of thing. But when I go to bed, even if I, I know I need a good night's sleep, I go to bed, but my mind is racing. Let's, I want us to talk about, you know, those of us, and I'm sure there are many, many of you out there who struggle to get eight hours sleep. Even if you go to bed and you want to sleep eight hours, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, we can't. And so what would you say to those people? You need to get over it, you need to change your lifestyle, or maybe you don't need quite as much. I, I think all of those are accurate. Um, while it's true that most people need somewhere around eight hours, there are a lot of people who function just fine on six and a half. So if you're a six and a half hour sleeper who tries to go to bed say an hour and a half before you get sleepy, mm -hmm. you're gonna have insomnia because you don't get sleepy for 90 minutes maybe. Yeah. Um, and if you lay in Been bed- Been there and done that. <laughs> uh, trying your hardest to fall asleep, you can become frustrated, you can feel like you're losing control over your sleep, and you can develop a full-blown clinical insomnia. Mm -hmm. So I think when you try too hard, absolutely. you know, like, you know, I've got an absolutely. important interview to do in the morning, I have to get to sleep, and it's like the harder you try, the more wide awake you are. Absolutely. Well, one thing you mentioned that really interests me is some people function fine on six and a half hours sleep. If someone was to go on your website, is there criteria there that helps them really define if they're functioning fine? Because I know there's people that I know who think they're functioning fine that I find to be somewhat distracted during the day, mm -hmm. you know, maybe even a little ADD-ish. They're not, their head's not dropping, but I don't mm -hmm. think they're functioning fine. Is there, is there some kind of criteria we can go on that says, you know, look at these things to see if you really are functioning fine? Uh, not so much on the website, but that's certainly something we do every day, all day in the office with folks, is trying to figure out if there are signs of sleep impairment in their daytime functioning. A lot of people, for example, don't think that uh, uh, falling asleep very, very fast is a particular problem, whereas that's a big red flag to us. Mm -hmm. So if a patient says, oh no, I can fall asleep anywhere, anytime, or I fall asleep when my head hits the pillow, that's You're not, sleep deprived. That's not a good okay, sign. There's something wrong 